Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. New York City has a significant problem. It's a problem of affordable housing for the individuals who reside, work in, in New York City. So today, with the help of my friend Eli Weiss, we put together a group of individuals who are going to talk about affordable housing in New York City. My guests include an architect, a leading architect, Ariel Afghan, who is the principal at Afghan Architects. Brenda Rosen, who is the president and CEO of Breaking Ground. As I said, my executive producer, Eli Weiss, the principal of Joy Construction. And last but not least, Blaise Bristello, who is the development director at Cobain Development Corp. So we've been honored to have an architect over here. Thank you for having me. Okay. So what's the difference about creating affordable housing and market rate housing? Well, I want to start by saying that there's a certain gratification to knowing that you're pulling people out of a housing condition that's undesirable and moving them into new product or newly renovated product. And that's a feeling I, I never get after finishing a market rate job. Uh, it, it seems that the tenants themselves, uh, you're having more of an effect on their lives and that they're really grateful for it. Uh, being able to provide amenities, uh, being able, able to provide a clean, safe place to live is something that... Um, that it's a very special opportunity that we're given here in New York City through the, through the mayor's programs. What type of apartments are being created? And then we'll go around the room. The, the marketing for affordable housing is very similar as the marketing for any other type of housing in the city. It depends on the neighborhood. Uh, there'll be a target demographic. And then you're going to decide the mix of apartments in that building based on that marketing study. So in some neighborhoods, we try to build more family-sized units. Uh, it's certainly larger two- and three-bedroom apartments, and in others, we build smaller uh, units, particularly in supportive housing. We try to build a lot of studio apartments um, because of single occupancy requirements. Uh, the designs themselves are pretty similar at this point. There was a time when the city required much larger apartments, coat closets, uh, large linen closets, larger kitchens. Things were unheard of in the market rate world. Under the current administration, to try to meet the demand, those regulations have been modified to allow for smaller units. So there really are similar with, designs. With regard to that, you know, New York City has this new program called Share NYC, which are going into creating smaller apartments. Oh, they nice. did the micro unit development in the Kipps Bay area. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, some of the units were affordable. Yeah. Brenda, you're in the supportive housing business. What's the difference between supportive housing and traditional affordable housing? Um, 
Well, I mean, traditionally supportive housing has been singles, so micro units, way before micro units became hip. Um, now we are doing uh, more and more uh, mixes of singles and families. So, and any supportive building is, um, so, some units are for formerly homeless and some units are for low income residents, just like any other affordable housing development. So, I mean, I guess what I'd say is that when it comes to a pure supportive building and you're doing singles, you have a, you know, you have a lot more units uh, in, a, in, a, in, le in, in the same amount of space. But when, it, when you're talking about um, finishes and, and amenities and design and sustainability, we don't look to do anything um, different than most market rate. Prior to the show, Eli was mentioning, I said, where, where are the affordable housing being built? And you said it's where the rezonings are. Uh, explain that. Sure. So uh, the mayor and the city have tremendous initiative to build affordable housing. Unfortunately, when you're building a product, whereas the rents are subsidized and below market and the costs of construction have continued to gone up, there are really two ways to make up the difference. One is actually the city writing a check or the federal government writing a check through various subsidy programs. Those are not infinite. And so at some point, government needs to come up with another concept in order to produce housing. What does the city have that is not infinite but more of is air. So the city will target a neighborhood, i.e. the Jerome Avenue rezoning inward, and look at a neighborhood and spend two to three years studying the neighborhood and then put forth a plan which will ultimately go through a public review period which will have a goal through the zoning uh, code to produce more housing. And so an affordable developer like myself or like Blaze or like Breaking Ground will look at this neighborhood and say, okay, this is somewhere where A, land is affordable, B, the city is incentivized um, to invest in that neighborhood because they're actually rezoning it. They want to see their plan come to fruition. And that's why you'll see a lot of the um, uh, large scale developments going on in areas that have been rezoned by the city. Let's talk about why Obain got involved with affordable. I mean, it's a major development co construction company. Yep. How, how they enter the New York City affordable market? I know about the Providence market. Yeah, so uh, our entry point into the New York market was actually through a large um, RFQ process on a, a site up in Hunts Point uh, in the Bronx. And we partnered with a, a couple of groups. Um, we have two partners uh, on the development side, Manny Management, which is a local nonprofit, affordable housing developer and manager of units and they managed several hundred units actually right in the in the neighborhood um, and then the Hudson companies which has done several affordable large-scale affordable projects um, throughout the city so um, that was kind of the impetus is we we had some we, we liked the site it was a big it's a big five acre site with a former youth detention facility called Spofford that the community closed down in, in 2011. Um, we had worked with um, a couple of community based groups there already uh, years ago. We had Our construction company had just finished a renovation and a, and a new construction uh, of a health clinic for urban health plan in the neighborhood on the other side of the Bruckner Boulevard. And so we we really looked at it and we said this is a this is a is a great site and we think we have relationships with some of the key uh, community groups on the ground and with some development partners that could really pull off a, a very uh, great project and you know you bring in the, the subject of partners okay why affordable housing developers traditionally have partners being it a nonprofit or another company why don't they do it themselves I think the first reason is all of us, at the end of the day, are mission-based. All of us are based on producing affordable housing and working with either the city or the state to do that. So there's a basic commonality that runs across the entire industry that the goal is to either meet or exceed the mayor's plan for housing. So unlike, I think, in the straight market rate world, where the ultimate goal is for everyone to make as much money as possible, for all of us, the success of our industry and the future of our industry is production. So when we look at partnerships, I look at them as if somebody knows a neighborhood better than me, mm -hmm. then we're going to have a better opportunity to be successful in that neighborhood. If somebody understands a specific program, um, then I'll have better success in that project. For example, I would partner with an organization like Breaking Ground because my background is not 
one of supportive housing. So if I was to do a large scale project that would have a supportive housing component, my first thought. I'm happy I put you together today. Yeah. <laughs> my first thought would be to call a successful afford uh, supportive housing developer with a track record. I wouldn't look at it as binary or competitive if it can make the project better as a whole. Um, that's what I'm thinking about. It's about production. Okay, prior to the show, we mentioned something called mandatory inclusionary housing. Mm -hmm. Who would like to explain to my audience what that means? I, think I, could, I could probably yeah. uh, do that if, it's, if it would be all right. Uh, every project that has a land use component, uh, be it either a BSA variance or a rezoning, is now required to have a certain percentage of affordable housing if the project increases the amount of housing permitted on the site. So that's a recent law, probably going on two Under years. Under the de Blasio administration. Under de Blasio. So going on two years uh, since it was passed. If you're going to have a BSA variance or a land use process that increases the number of units, you then have to have a component of low income or moderate income, income housing in the building. And, and I think what's mostly different is it's also permanently so affordable. Explain to right. me which, for example, a building in Manhattan. Explain. So we were all very accustomed to 80-20s, right? We know 80-20s for many years. This is essentially a mandatory program where you have to have that 20% that of affordable housing in those older projects that was used in order to achieve a tax uh, right, tax abatement. Right, 20-year tax abatement. Right. Now, whether you have a tax abatement or not, you have to provide a certain amount of affordable housing. In perpetuity. In perpetuity. In perpetuity. Yeah. So that dovetails with the tax abatement, luckily, after a little bit of negotiation between the city and the state, they, the two dovetail together, so you would qualify for the abatement, but even if you didn't, you would still be required to have low-income housing forever in that building. What percentage of the building has to be low-income housing? There are different alternatives, and they range from 25% mm -hmm. to 30%. To 30 uh, generally speaking, the higher the percentage, the higher the income permitted in the low-income component. So the lower percentage within the building, the higher income you're allowed to have uh, as a threshold for those residents. But you, you know, people, when they hear the word affordable housing, they believe it's only low-income affordable housing. You can, get, you can earn up to 125% of the area median income and qualify for an apartment. You can earn up to 165% right. right, of the AMI. Right. And earn so, I mean, people hear this misnomer and they don't understand. Uh, how does somebody... And I think this is an important fact that should come out. How does somebody get an affordable apartment, okay, in one of these developments in the city? They see the newspaper article, they see it on the internet, but they don't understand, okay? They're not really educated in the, the procedure or the orientation to learn how to win an affordable apartment. Well, I think the city has done a lot actually to, to try to simplify the process um, by, by putting it online and allowing people to register for what's called Housing Connect. You can, you can put your basic information in and apply to several lotteries at one time. Um, that doesn't mean that going through the process is simple at all. Um, you know, we not only rent up our own buildings, but we do it for a plethora of for-profit developers. Um, and, you know, we average 50 to 80,000 applications. 50 to 80,000 applications per building. Per building. Per building, per building so, and where you can maybe have 100 units, 150 units available. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the likelihood of you getting called, I mean, the reason it's called a lottery, it's really a lottery. Um, and, then, and then the eligibility requirements around, um, around being able to, to move into that unit are very, very prescriptive. I remember a couple of years ago there were affordable condominiums and affordable cooperatives. Are they still around? So back in the day there were affordable condominiums and affordable cooperatives. Unfortunately during the housing crisis what ended up happening was those projects weren't able to get end loans when the average person in America was having a difficult time getting a mortgage in the wake of the subprime crisis. Getting an end loan uh, lender like uh, who would give your typical mortgage to lend into a project that had a, you know, income restrictions, a regulatory agreement, was very challenging. The city is now, however, coming out with a new initiative. It's not out yet in written term sheet, but I would say that over the next year or so, you will see new homeownership programs and projects. I, I mean, there was a lot of that done in Inwood, in, not in Inwood, in uh, the Rockaways. That is correct. There are a significant number of units which help 
the community grow. And then part of it, in addition, is that they built required retail, you know, to help the community and the YMCA and other scenarios over there. I, I think when people use the word affordable housing, it gets pigeonholed into what people think is, you know, building housing, whether it be Section 8 or supportive. It is a wide uh, it is a wide field of development. So it's everything from home ownership to middle income, from supportive housing to very low income housing. Most of the projects have either a community facility component or a retail component. So when you look at neighborhoods over the years that have gone through tremendous change, like Harlem, like the Rockaways, it's very hard to not point to S affordable since, housing as the impetus. Okay, since we are land restricted, okay, we only have X amount of land, how are we able to increase the amount of affordable housing. Some of it on the NYCHA properties, New York City Housing Authority properties, mm -hmm. taking other areas and rezoning, as uh, Ariel said before. Where are the opportunities today, and where are you building affordable housing? So, we, yeah, we were talking about this before the show. East, East New York, Brownsville, uh, a lot of areas in the Bronx, um, uh, you know, Inwood, uh, where the rezonings are happening, but also just where you can purchase land if you're going to have mm -hmm. to actually purchase property and it's not coming through a, a disposition of city-owned land where it's affordable, where you can buy something at a buildable square foot that the city at the end of the day will underwrite because the city is looking at a limited finance a uh, finite pool of resources that they have to create units and they want to spend the units on the bricks and mortar and not on the land uh, to the, as much as to the extent as possible. So that's, that's right. I would say the opportunities aren't just geographic either. Some of them uh, we found to be legislative. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is um, when the city passed zoning for quality and affordability, which was a major overhaul of the zoning code, they included substantial parking reductions and in some cases waivers for low and moderate income housing. I mean there was no real need for the parking. That's right. I've seen more of my clients who have been looking at sites to develop market rate housing switch to affordable housing because they wouldn't need to excavate a cellar. So I don't know if that was intended by people much smarter than us or if it just happens to be a byproduct of that. So they're looking at a piece of property they're going to acquire for a certain amount of money in order to build market rate rental housing, workforce housing, in, in the borough somewhere. They're running their numbers for construction costs, and they determine that excavating the cellar to put the parking required for market rate housing is more expensive than the loss of revenue that, would, uh, that they would incur if they switched the program to affordable and didn't build the basement. I, I think when people ask me all the time, call me up and say, I have a piece of land for you, my response is almost the same, always, always the same, which is I don't buy land in today's environment for the last three years. I think if you're in our business, you need to make land. And so if you were to ask everybody, how many here on the panel are building or in pre-development on a project where you're working with a religious institution who owned the land prior and you're maximizing, I think we'd all raise our hands. If you were to ask everybody who's working on a project that involves uh, you know, a NYCHA RFP, we're working on one right next to each other, we would all raise our hand. Who's working on a project where we've rezoned something, we'd all raise our hand. We are, you know, if a broker were to call me and say I have a piece of land for you, uh, that's already, you know, buying, I grew up uh, in a bakery, that's already buying the bread. We have to start with the dough and the yeast and we make the bread. You can't really make it work anymore just buying the bread whole. How does tell. a nonprofit exist in this world? I mean, you're competing with the, the capitalists over here, the <laughs> two capitalists over here. I mean, you, in a lot uh, of ways. Yeah. I mean, so first off, the city and the state like to see partnerships, right? So when, when an RFP comes out, the goal is to but find a in, good team. In, for example, you're doing in Brooklyn right now, yeah. in Dumbo. I mean, oh, you're, in Dumbo. you're, you're in, a, in a very hot neighborhood, mm -hmm. which would be a market rate type of project. How, how how the little what? nonprofit over there with the the CEO uh, the dynamic CEO get that property? Um, we just have our ears to the ground like everybody else, and and found out that. So explain it might what you're doing line. in Dumbo. We acquired 90 Sands, which was part of the Jehovah's Witness um, set of properties. It's 508 units, 90 of which are one small one bedrooms. The balance are 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 uh, uh, studios. It is. It is, the, it is an exquisite building and perfect for supportive housing because that's exactly the size apartment that we're looking for. Um, it requires very little renovation and um, it has a ton of space to have a community partner in there and have enough um, space to have a full 
array of services that we need. And it'll, it'll range, it's not a tax credit deal, so it will have a set aside for people exiting homelessness, but it'll also have as low as 30% of AMI up to 100% of AMI. So it's really bringing um, integrated housing into a neighborhood that would otherwise never have it. Let's talk about your, what you're doing in the Bronx with Jerome Avenue and... Sure, so we have a project that we're working on with Ariel on uh, Jerome Avenue. One of the sites we're actually working with a local non profit Community Access, who actually is gonna build a supportive housing project in the Bronx. We're gonna build one site with about 500 units of a mix of low and middle income units. We have a project in Soundview right now that's under construction, again with Ari, that we rezoned from an R5 to an R7A. That's 326 units of mixed income housing. And we have a three building project right now on the lower concourse in Concourse Village West, which is also a mix of middle and income and low income housing. When we build housing, we have to also have amenities, okay? Mm -hmm. We speak about supportive housing, but we also need retail. What type of retail are you building in, within these complexes? Well, generally the retail is usually pretty small depending on where you know, how, where the site is, is it in the, you know, a whole block, is it in the middle of a block, is it just a corner? Um, and if it's not on a retail corridor, generally we're not doing retail, but we'll do some kind of community facility amenity for, for an affordable building. What about the FRESH program for the, the groceries? I, I feel yeah. like it's, the FRESH the program and affordable housing, um, the, the benefits that were already existing in affordable housing already outweighed what the FRESH program brought. I, what I'm finding, as the retail world has changed dramatically yeah. in the last five years, is Ari and I finished a project on 175th and Cortona Parkway. We had 30,000 square feet of retail, which when we started the project together, uh, probably in 2006, we envisioned traditional retailers. Uh, we ended up renting to the Children's Aid Society for a program office and 15, the balance of the 15,000 square feet to Montefiore Hospital and then to a small dental practice. So I think what you're seeing is a shift in retail regardless across the industry and commercial real estate. But as it plays to affordable housing, we're using the retail more as sort of community development and economic development. And also we view that as an amenity to the building as well. But you mentioned the FRESH program. Uh, that actually ties in pretty neatly with your question about how do you acquire sites. I've done a couple of FRESH program buildings, meaning that there's a bonus in the residential FAR in exchange for a permanent uh, supermarket on the ground floor with a certain capacity to sell fresh food. All of those have been landowners who are supermarket operators. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the developer approaches the landowner who operates the supermarket, they forward some sort of a deal, and then the operator comes back in to operate his new supermarket. I haven't really seen any projects where on spec people are building supermarket spaces without having an operator already on board. We approached an operator of a fresh program who had done two or three of those and then said, do you want to come to a project that we were already going through the rezoning? So we didn't need the, the bonus FAR, but we were able to, to offer a site and they were you know, interested in that. Has there been enough affordable housing created, especially since you've done work in the Hudson Yards area? I think what's been created mostly in Hudson Yards has been the set-asides in the AD20 buildings. Um, again, as land prices go up, it's very difficult to develop an all-affordable um, building in these areas. But there have been, I mean, it's slightly north of Hudson Yards, but Gotham's project on the west side uh, in the 40s and 11. Right, but that was done a couple of years ago. I'm talking right. about new projects. So new projects now in those areas will mostly have affordable housing as tied to either mandatory inclusionary zoning or a tax abatement. When land prices get to a point, um, the, it, it's not always the best investment for the city to be investing capital dollars into a neighborhood where you're mostly subsidizing the land cost. When somebody wins an affordable lottery, they're permanent in that unit. Do you think it's appropriate that somebody, even though they may be earning more later on, maintains this apartment for the rest of their lives? It's a rent-stabilized apartment like, like any other unit. I mean, people ask me the same exact questions about our the breaking ground supportive buildings because, again, about 40% of all of our buildings go to um, folks at or below 60% of AMI. You can come in and you can work your tail off and, and, and triple your income. You don't have to leave. Um, people choose to leave for a variety of reasons, including size, family, etc. 
but it's no different than but the irony is in Long Island under the affordable housing that's created by the Long Island housing partnership you have to show your income and if you earn more you can be dis placed out of the units yeah in New York City it, right, yeah. it, it's I not see. that way and I think right. all of us would like to think that our tenancy would use getting that unit as a platform to do better. We'd love to see mm -hmm. the tenancy do better. It speaks to the viability of the industry, it speaks to the success of the industry. And the other thing is that even when you have people that are doing better, you know, you have to figure out where are you gonna go. <laughs> so I, we have a building on, on 28th Street between Madison and Fifth. It may be a small studio, you may be making more money, but what are you gonna trade it up for? Because there's not a lot out there. So it's, it's a very difficult thing. Yeah, I'd echo what everybody said. I mean, I think um, if people are working and making resources and they choose to stay, it's just like any other rent-stabilized apartment in the city. That's a, that's a great thing. So I think in summation, I think uh, the mayor, following the tradition of the previous mayor, who did a great job on affordable housing and rezoning in the city or over there, you know, we're building and we're building as much as we can and we're being, builders are being creative with creative architects to create and nonprofits and supportive organizations to build the necessary affordable housing. We are landlocked, but we'll grow in the, in the condition. I'd like to thank uh, Ariel, Brenda, Eli, and Blaze, and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.